Um, moving on to our next speaker, we've got um, Christy Bly and Randy uh, Matchett. And they're gonna be talking about aerial and ground-based delivery of plague protecting baits to advance black-footed ferret recovery. Christy is the manager of the World Wildlife Fund's Black-Footed Ferret Program. And Randy has been also been a biologist with Fish and Wildlife Service on the CMR National Wildlife Refuge in Montana for 34 years. Um, go ahead, Christy. Well, hello everybody, good afternoon. I hope you guys are uh, staying warm and the sun is shining wherever you are. Uh, thank you so much to all of you on the South Dakota Wildlife Society team for uh, the invitation to speak with you today. Randy and I are going to tag team this uh, mostly and yeah, we'll just jump right in. We're switching gears a little bit here and just wanted to say thanks to the organizers for accommodating our schedule today. And let's see if we can get some movement forward on my slide here. There we go. So the Blackfoot ferret, as many of you know, is one of the most endangered mammals in North America. Historically, thousands of Blackfoot ferrets once occupied prairie dog colonies throughout the Great Plains from Canada to Mexico. Today, however, there are you know, about 400 in the wild, uh, less than that in captivity. And uh, in any case, we need 3,000 individuals in the wild to remove them from the federal list of threatened and endangered species. So we have a long way to go. Black-footed ferrets depend on prey dogs for survival. Again, many of you already know this. Prey dogs are their primary prey and they use prey dog burrows for shelter and raising young. And so consequently, the fate of the Blackfoot ferret is tied to that of its prey dog prey. Populations of prey dogs and Blackfoot ferrets both declined precipitously in the late 1800s and early 1900s with the conversion of native prairie into cropland agriculture and large scale government sponsored poisoning programs aimed at prairie dogs. In addition, sylvatic plague also contributed to their demise um, and it remains the primary biological threat to the recovery of the Blackfoot ferret today. Sylvatic plague is a non-native disease. It's transmitted by fleas that are infected with the plague bacterium. Um, it really actually came over to North America from Asia on ships carrying flea infested rats into the San Francisco Harbor in the early 1900s and it then spread east via mammal population. So those fleas essentially jumped ship and kind of started its way into the mammal system here in the US and into the Midwest eventually. It's highly lethal to both prairie dogs and ferrets. They have little natural immunity to it because it's non-native. Um, and once a prairie dog colony is infected by it, um, it spreads quickly and it really can remove almost 98, 99% of the prairie dogs there. And of course, without prairie dogs, ferrets starve. Thankfully, we have an injectable vaccine, plague vaccine for black-footed ferrets. Um, it receives a vaccine, you know, once an individual receives a vaccine and a booster about a month later, uh, it's protected from plague for its lifetime. And it does take a lot of effort to live trap these little guys in the wild. Uh, twice each year to administer a vaccine and its booster. Travis Livieri can tell you all about that if you haven't had experience yourself. These guys are nocturnal, so they uh, require a lot of evening time work. Um, so while protecting 400 ferrets in the wild or so is one feat in and of itself, it's an entirely different story trying to protect millions of prairie dogs. So one of the most effective tools that we are using today uh, is a product called Deltamethrin, Delta Dust. Um, it curtails prairie dog, pop, it curtails flea populations that live in prairie dog colonies. Um, so when you spray it down into the burrow, that's the goal is to reduce those flea populations, which fleas are the vector of plague. So that's important for us to be doing. Uh, it does have its limitations as effective as this dust is in curtailing plague in prairie dog colonies. It's very labor intensive to apply. It takes a lot, a lot of time and effort to get crews out there to cover 
thousands of acres of prairie dogs on an annual basis. Um, you know, so field crews either walk or drive an ATV to each borough, typically along transects, and then five, four to six grams need to be sprayed down in, to each borough. So um, that needs to happen. And it's expensive. It's cost about 25 to 27 dollars an acre, which on an annual basis needs to be applied. So that adds up. You know, if you're talking about um, protecting 2,000 acres of habitat, like you see here in this picture in Wyoming, that's you know maybe a month's worth of time. But if you're talking about covering 13,000 acres or more over on the Buffalo Gap National Grassland, it could be an entire summer, depending on how many rain-free days you have. So the other challenge we have with dust is that there's a lot of human error naturally that's involved. You know, sometimes there's too little dust sprayed into a burrow. Sometimes there's too much dust. Sometimes the dust isn't sprayed deep enough, and that. Um, really ends up um, with poor flea control, rendering prairie dogs more susceptible to plague than otherwise would be. In addition, our colleague David Eads uh, and others found that delta methrin, um, that fleas actually can de develop a resistance to delta methrin over time. So on two colonies in South Dakota treated with delta dust um, annually for eight or more years, flea prevalence um, was, you know, that it was actually ineffective when it was treated in these colonies for eight or more years and that flea prevalence rebounded really quickly. So typically we get almost a year of effectiveness in flea control, but after eight years of application in these two colonies, fleas rebounded in a month's time. And we found similar results in Wyoming after only five or six years of annual application. So this has definitely um, instigated the need to create additional plague mitigation tools. So um, many moons ago, an oral somatic plague vaccine bait was developed um, by US Geological Survey National Wildlife Health Center and the University of Wisconsin. Um, and so they worked on lab trials for the bait vaccine. We affectionately call it SPV. Uh, in the early 2000s. And then those results were actually pretty promising. So some initial field results occurred in 2012, or at least started in 2012, with these original cube-shaped baits dyed with rhodamine B to evaluate individual prey dog uptake. Um, and so researchers distributed these baits painstakingly by hand on nine by nine meter grids to equate to 50 baits per acre in black-tailed prey dogs. Um, on small test plots. Um, and so these actually, the, the initial field trial results were promising. So larger field trials ensued. Um, and so then in 2013 to 2015, a whole bunch of people got together uh, covering a whole bunch of acres in a whole bunch of states on four prairie dog species to evaluate the effectiveness of sylvatic plague vaccine at, um, at least across its range. And so as field trials were underway during that 2013 to 2015 time frame, you know, our hopes were really rising that this was going to be the holy grail of plague mitigation, that we could effectively distribute baits and have plague effectiveness that would um, replace dust or at least be a tool that we could use instead of, or in addition to it, um, but we needed two things in particular with these baits. And one was to figure out how to mass produce them. Um, you know, how do you produce millions of baits that you can put out? And then how do you deliver them across many thousands of acres cheaply and efficiently? Randy Matchett, my collaborator in crime and the innovator that he is, um, he began to research ways to mass produce baits and ended up talking to this guy named Eddie in Lithuania who makes what you see here is a boily roller machine originally made uh, for making carp fishing baits. So anyway, this machine has turned out to be the holy grail for making baits here in the United States. And our partners from Colorado Parks and Wildlife helped perfect the managing, manufacturing process of these um, vaccine laced peanut butter flavored because prairie dogs love peanut butter. Um, baits that we dye blue so we can see them out in the field. And prairie dogs have a better time seeing them as well. 
So now that we've got the baits, you know, we had the baits, we're like, okay, great. How are we gonna get them out over thousands of acres of prairie dog colonies? So uh, it all began again with Randy's innovation. <laughs> he spent an entire Christmas break, which, you know, Randy never takes breaks. So he spent uh, many months looking into research on bait delivery mechanisms and looked at options that range from uh, paintball guns to gumball machines to see how, you know, people have traditionally put baits out on landscapes, you know, everything from how um, raccoon baits were put out back, you know, against rabies from airplanes, et cetera, et cetera. I dove into fundraising for how we could pay for making something if we figured it out. Um, and then I was in the airport in Salt Lake City and met this drone guy who um, knew an engineer in the Netherlands. And turns out we ended up contracting that Netherlands engineer to make us um, a dispenser that could deliver at least one bait at a time. Um, and so we were going down that path, but the problem was we couldn't find a, uh, we didn't have enough money to buy a ready-made drone. So we're trying to figure out how we could meet a drone manufacturer that would be willing to work with us on black fruit ferret budgets. And uh, in a stroke of luck, Randy met a guy named Kurt Krieger, he was with Model Avionics, which is a small drone making uh, company in Billings. And Kurt, like Randy, was also an innovator, which helped tremendously. Um, so we ended up contracting with Kurt um, and he was able to help us take that single shooter developed earlier and build us a multi-rotor drone, which we named Shep. And uh, Shep is named after the ranch dog that killed a ferret in Matizi, Wyoming, that led to the discovery of that last remaining population and ultimately saved the species from extinction. So this was a long story here, but basically here and began our partnership, uh, our three musketeer partnership where if Randy could think it, Kurt could build it and Christy could fund it. And here it is, here's Shep, our flying machine. And uh, it was really exciting because uh, that partnership developed the first ever bait dispensing machine to protect prairie dogs from plague in the field. Um, we automate, to automate, you know, to automate, to auto, <laughs> I'm not gonna be able to say this word, <laughs> to fly Shep on its own. Uh, we used open source mission planner software and really Brandy's brain powers. It took a lot of spreadsheets, you know, taking prairie dog polygons and figuring out how to make sure we could get transex lines in each individual prairie dog colony. Um, anyway, to follow these transex, transex lines that you see here in this screen um, that would drop a bait via GPS controlled trigger along that nine by nine meter grid pattern so that we could uniformly distribute 50 baits per acre. Um, and this actually worked out really well. And um, we actually were so happy about it that we're like, okay, let's make it bigger, faster, faster, bigger, more baits at a time. What can we do more to cover more ground quickly? So I got more money. Randy went back to the drawing board with Kurt and um, they developed the first ATV triple shooting dispenser um, in a very short three month period of time um, back in 2016. And this system really enhanced our ability to deliver vaccine baits efficiently by automatically dropping on each GPS controlled trigger again, uh, one bait straight down and simultaneously shooting one bait nine meters to the left and one bait nine meters to the right. And that way we were effectively trading three transect lines at once with one pass with ATV. And we averaged shooting about 50 acres per hour with the system. And if your name is Randy Matchett, it was closer to hundred acres per hour in some cases. So really effective. Here's a map of the GPS track logs of the ATV transects following the preloaded parallel line transects. Um, that were spaced 27 meters apart. And um, yeah, again, we were able to cover 50 baits per acre in this particular colony, um, colonies on the Charles M. Russell National Wildlife Refuge in Montana, covered 1,200 acres in two and a half days. 
Um, and, you know, at the time in 2017, this is one of the largest ferret populations in the wild. So this was an important endeavor in protecting prairie dog habitat to protect ferrets that were at that site. So here's what that looks like uh, with um, the triple shooter coming from Shep now too. So we took that same design and attached it um, or at least retrofitted it and designed it for the AT from the ATV to Shep, the drone. Um, and between both the ATV triple shooters and the drone triple shooters, we were able to treat 7,000 acres across Colorado, Montana, and South Dakota in 2017 using these SPD baits, which was super exciting. I'm going to play a video. I think it's four minutes left, just so you know. Yep, it's perfect. I'm going to play a short okay. video. I think it's going to be better if I play it um, off the internet so you guys can hear it. So just bear with me. We will get this played. Black-footed ferrets are thought to be extinct two different times. I mean, I've been on the endangered species track for a long time, and a lot of people are working to recover. Ferrets are an obligate predator of prairie dogs. It's the only place they can live and survive is on prairie dogs. So hey, Christy, we can hear it, but not see in a video. It looks like you're muted right now, too. Okay, so that's a bummer. I can see it here. Maybe I need to share the screen. You, you need to you need to unshare your PowerPoint and then share your yep. your browser. Exactly. Thanks for that, you guys. Sorry about that. Okay, I'll back up. I'm sitting here watching it. <laughs> okay, here we go. Can you see it now? Yep. Yep. Ferrets are an obligate predator of prairie dogs. That's the only place they can live and survive is on prairie dog homes. Probably one of the biggest obstacles to ferret recovery is. Christy, we're not here in the video now. I think when you muted yourself. It's okay. And we put peanut butter into it as an attractant for the gray dogs, as well as mix with that some white in there. It takes maybe more than 10,000 acres of prairie dogs to support what might be a viable ferret population. And the objective under World Wildlife Fund and all the partners that we work with is to remove the black footed ferret from the endangered species list. But if we're going to start treating thousands of acres, we have to find a distribution system. And the best idea so far is a unit that will distribute from ATV, sort of a hopper that will drop one pellet straight down and then shoot one to the left and shoot one to the right there and take simultaneously. And I've been able to treat about 50 acres per hour on an ATV. And the other idea came up with using unmanned aerial systems. There's a lot of places I imagine that are going to be not ATV accessible. That's where this little guy is really going to show its true work. So we have loaded the correct amount of um, pellets. Uh, we'll put the hopper on. We'll we go ahead and click in the autonomous mode, and then it takes off and does its uh, mission. We're about 60 feet up, flying at about 20 miles per hour. So you can watch it go down that transect line on the computer so we get to see exactly what's going on. So uh, every one second, it will drop a pellet. So they eat the baits, and that immunizes them against the disease. This project has involved so many collaborators, a molecular biologists that created the vaccine in the first place, and all the field partners that have helped us. So I think it's something like 30 different agencies involved in each project. We've talked a long time about how we would deliver millions of baits to prairie dogs. And so it's been great to see these people get together and really figure out how we could do it. This project fits well with a mission of World Wildlife Fund to use the best available science to achieve our conservation objectives and to bring back the endangered black bear. ferret. Great, and so I will um, just wrap up here since we are out of time with um, that. You know, we've definitely faced many challenges along the way, everything from bait jams to broken parts to uh, 
um, crashing SHEP at one point in time and you know, some challenges with effectiveness of the vaccine. Um, but we are a persist persistent bunch. And so we are addressing all of these things. We're looking into new tools. Uh, we're re rebuilding another drone so that we have duplicate efforts um, to cover more ground. Um, and there's just a lot of things on the horizon that we're really excited for and that um, having these delivery systems um, will enable us to facilitate in the future. Um, and it matters because Blackwood Affairs matter. You know, these guys, the mass banded of prey, you know, we really need substantial acres of prey dogs for their survival. Um, survival of prey dogs is dependent on mitigating plague as well. Um, and so this innovation and technology is a really important way for us to move forward in that endeavor and to delist the Blackfoot of Barrett. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Christy. That's fascinating stuff. Um, we do have one typed in question from Dan Spingen. We could just do that question real quick. He's wondering what the wind limits are for your aerial and ground dispersal, dispersal baits. Randy, are you with us? Do you want to take that? Sure. Um, 10 to 15 miles an hour with the drone was uh, about our limit, just over 10. And there's really no limit on ATVs with, with any wind, wind issues. Great. Well, thank, thank you both for sharing your research with us and taking the time to visit with us today. Um, 